<laughs> so, quick overview. This is what I'm going to try to get through in 20 minutes. I know it's a lot, and I know I have a short amount of time, so save your questions for later, but maybe indicate if I'm really losing you. <clears throat> uh, this this uh, forum, this forum is welcoming diversity, so I started thinking from a conflict or conflict resolution point of view, how do I see diversity? And I checked out the, the dictionary definition, the English dictionary definition, and it's variety. And it's all about, it's also here, inclusion, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all including, 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 where I looked at the, the Google translation, <clears throat> not the best, but here. And of course we have variety, diversity, et cetera, et cetera, but down here we also have irregular, okay? different or disorder. It seems to me it's more of an exclusion type take, take on things, which that in itself is conflict. I mean, usually when I, when I start this, I say, you know, this morning I couldn't decide what kind of coffee I would get. I would get a large coffee or a small coffee, and that's my conflict for today. But I think this is a good conflict to think about, in that one word has different ideas for different people coming from different cultures and different languages. We could be talking about uh, diversity, <clears throat> but maybe our idea of diversity is completely different. So that in itself is a conflict that needs to be resolved. Uh, today, <clears throat> the, the most important part is constructive controversy, which I see as like a debate 2.0. Okay? In that we, we use a lot of debate in language class. And we, we take you know, side A, side B, have a topic, fight about it, and there's a winner and a loser. For me as a conflict resolution person, that doesn't work so well. <clears throat> I want to take it that one step further, which I will describe later, but it's taking the debate format and then asking more questions. And asking those questions using and following some easy guidelines. Okay, and that's where we're going now. Conflict. What do you think? Conflict is usually fighting. It's our reaction. We want to avoid conflict. Conflict is something negative or dangerous. Uh, but I want us to kind of rethink our attitude towards conflict. I want us to have a, a, a different view, which includes embracing conflict, saying we have conflict. Let's take it into our lives and try to harness it and deal with it. So conflict is neither good nor bad. It's just conflict. And I think that we, we also, as a society, we, we see it, tend to see it as a negative type thing. And you know, guns, for example, I mean, guns are just guns. <clears throat> it's how we use them that changes how we perceive them. A good example, I think, is fire. <laughs> okay? when, we, when we control fire, we can cook food, we can heat our houses, we can develop. Uh, and so in this case, maybe fire is good. But fire can also be destructive. Fire can destroy property, lives, uh, the environment, etc. So how we control fire is what makes it good or bad, not fire itself. So conflict could be positive evolution, where we, we look into the conflict and we try to grow from it and develop from it, or it can just be pure pain. So that's our choice. And conflict is all around us, every day. Uh, today, deciding to take this train or that train, that is conflict. And we, we forget that, that you know, waking up, for me, <laughs> waking up you know, 10 minutes earlier and getting a chance to go outside and have a little walk, or getting up and rushing to the train station, that's a conflict. Uh, it's an integral part of our lives, and it is very powerful. Very, very powerful. <clears throat> we can reduce conflict, but we can't eliminate it. So it's something that's always in our lives. And I think we, we sort of have an idea, we, if we avoid conflict, we, we won't have to deal with it anymore, but it's always there, so embrace it. <clears throat> Another thing, my, my field, conflict resolution, people, a lot of people see it as compromise. It just means, okay, conflict, conflict, well, I get half, you get half, type of thing. And I, I believe that that's a mistake. Conflict resolution is not about compromise. It's, uh, it's something a little bit different in that it's looking for a better way. Do you, I don't know if any of you know the story about the, the orange and the kids. Maybe, yes, no, okay, great, mind blower. <coughs> uh, this is a story about an orange. Two kids are fighting over one orange. They, they both want the orange. And as the most people would say, okay, we'll just cut the orange in half. And one kid gets half an orange, the other kid gets the other half, right? So 
this, yay, everybody's happy. But we get 50% and 50%. Now, what if the parent actually took the time to ask the children, why do you want the orange? And this is conflict resolution. When, he, when one child says, I want to eat the orange, and the other child says, I don't want to eat the orange, I, I want, just want the skin of the orange to make a cake. So if we'd ask that question, we could have 100%, 100% resolution. That's conflict resolution. It's not compromise. It's finding a better way. Okay. So for me, this kind of blew my mind when I first started thinking about it, thinking about it on a larger scale. <coughs> Bat now. Uh, another big catchphrase. No? OK, great. <laughs> Pardon me? Uh, Batman, best alternative to negotiated agreement. Uh, these are two, two very famous people, Fisher and Uri. They, they came up with this in the 90s with a book called Getting to Yes. And Batna is basically where you, you look at a situation and you think, if I can't resolve this conflict, if we can't become friends, we can't make it work, what is the best, best resolution that I can come to? What is the best situation I can come to without making friends, without working with another party? And you have, you have to ask, your, you have to question the strength of your alternative. You have to say, do, is this really, like, oftentimes we have a dream idea that in this situation, if I don't talk to them, I will still have a good, a good result. But we should question that. Is it really going to be a good result or do we just believe it's a good result? So any situation, any kind of conflict situation, you need to ask, what do you really want? What is the best situation? And then what are you content with? What is okay? And what can you live with? These three are very important. Because below this, we actually shouldn't be resolving conflict. We should be dealing with it a different way. But above this, just living with something is not so bad. You know, a rainy day may not be your first choice, but we can live with it. So we can we can move on with that. Now this is ah, 20 minutes, <laughs> not enough time, but Hopefully you have questions about this later. Uh, Badna is, the best thing is to understand yours. Understand what is it that you can live with and to search for theirs, the other person. Try to understand what is it that they need? What is it they want? Now we're getting sort of into more of the guidelines. Uh, think, before any kind of, of conflict discussion, any kind of constructive controversy, we need to get the students to think, or we need, we need to think. In the, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it nice? And is it kind? Now, nice and kind, I know they're pretty much the same thing. But it's actually the most important part. I mean, if we're nice to people, if we're thinking and trying to be kind, many conflicts of situations quickly resolve themselves. Communication styles. There are many different communication styles. Understanding these is important. You know, we've got avoidance, accommodation, passivity, compromise, and aggression. These are not so helpful in our situation. We need collaboration. We need flexibility. So if your students are heading down a different direction here, you might want to try to bring them back into a collaborative environment and to get them to stay flexible. I statements, not you statements. Uh, it's, it's absolutely no problem for me to say I feel uncomfortable. You know, I feel scared, I feel worried. That's my feelings. But saying to someone else that you do this and you do that is not within our, our acceptable route. I, believe. We don't, I have no idea what you are thinking right now. <laughs> but I can say what I'm thinking, and that's important. Active listening. <clears throat> Actually listening to what people are saying as opposed to just, uh, 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 uh. Uh, you know, <laughs> but you know this, right? <laughs> Validating what people say, like saying, I understand, I agree with you, and, and giving them support as they're trying to get out ideas. Reframing, uh, taking a situation where there might be some trigger words, there might be some dangerous words that cause, like, I hate this or I hate that. Take out the hate and just describe the situation. So reframing is, is a way to try to selectively maintain the information but take out the emotional trigger points. Uh, showing empathy, of course, understanding or trying to understand the situation from another person's point of view. 
And summarizing, paraphrasing, when we're actually talking, when we're listening, to sit down and say, is this exactly what you need? Is this what you're talking about? Because so many times we make mistakes. So many times I think I know exactly what you're talking about, but I don't. Take us back to diversity. Maybe someone's talking about diversity, and I'm thinking biodiversity. You know, I'm thinking about all the little bugs in my garden. But maybe that's a different type of diversity than they're looking at. So get in there, summarize, paraphrase, make sure that everyone's all on the same page. Many rules. I'm not going to read through them. But uh, top one, what I think is most important, be critical of ideas and not of people. Okay. You can, it's, I, I'm totally happy with you saying, I hate your idea. That's fantastic. <laughs> you know, hate my idea, give me a reason, give me support for that, and I learn. But I hate you is a different situation. So always reminding our students to separate. That way we can deal with very, very difficult topics. And we can say, I hate your idea about this. That's great. But not you. Uh, next one, uh, third down, I think. The goal is the best decision. It's not winning. It's not about winning a fight or something. It's about trying to find the best decision that both of you can offer. So going back to collaboration. And for me, differentiation before integration. Uh, before we start making decisions, before we start saying this is the way we're going to go, I want to think of new ideas, expand, use our creativity try to see a new way, get all these ideas, then come back and make a decision. You know, making, <clears throat> making a decision based on limited information, we all know, is not necessarily the best outcome. I'll step back for a few moments if you guys want to take a look at those. They're, they're good. They're Johnson & Johnson 2006 published this list, and it's a good standby. I use these in class. It's, it's one of sort of my first introduction classes to the students where I say, these are the rules that I expect we are going to follow. On rules. Conflict preferences. Uh, when, <clears throat> in my classes I have a long list of questions and statements that I ask the students to agree or disagree with. And what I want them to do is to start to figure out what are their built-in preferences? What are things that they think and believe without actually thinking about them. This might be one of them. Certain groups and individuals are superior to others. We might have a knee-jerk reaction to say no or yes, but I need us to think about all the variables there. It is true. Ichiro is a better baseball player than I am. That's the way it is. I can't play music. I'm terrible at music, but I'm good at other things. But on a, you know, a large scale, certain groups, it starts getting a little more fuzzy. But I want the students to start thinking about that and identifying which groups, how the, the, for example, a professional baseball team is still better than me as a group. But as a group, another type of group, maybe not the case. Like when some people say to me, uh, you people do that, doesn't really appeal to me. <clears throat> Interests. Also, when, when we're dealing with, with uh, conflict or constructive controversy, we need to know why. Why we are invested in this situation? Why are we interested? Why do we care? Know yours, discover theirs. Try to find why the other person cares about this conflict. And then find your shared interests. Find out what, hey, wait a minute, I care about this and you care about this. That's the starting point. That's where we can start building from. And the thing that really blocks us finding shared interests, stereotyping. When we fall back into, you must think that, you believe this. And all of us, we, we're pretty familiar with stereotype, and we know that it's something that we want to avoid or at least understand. But this one, expectations, I think is a, a little bit of a danger zone, that we have expectations. We have expectations of other teachers, we have expectations of, others, of our students, of our partners. Uh, this, to me, is like a personalized stereotype. <laughs> and, that can also cause us a lot of trouble. And we have to sit back and say, you know, this person never told me they would do that. I just expected them to do that. But that's something that's built into me. It's my problem, not theirs. Ask. Ask why, why not, what if. Ask advice. Ask. Always, always, always ask questions. 
Ask reality testing questions. Ask, I like your idea, but is that possible? I mean, really get people to think, you know, is this a dreamy kind of idea or is this actually feasible? And for me, find the way out. Okay? You, you, you get into something, there's always got to be a way out. You know, you can't get in and just start messing around. You've got to find an escape route. Now, I'm a surfer. So, I don't know if you guys are surfers, but looking at this wave, you might think, oh, wow, nice wave, lots of power, lots of water moving, it's good stuff. But this is a nice wave. Because I've got a power point here and I've got a way out. I can use the energy of that wave, I can enjoy it and get out safely. Looking back at the original wave, there's no real safe exit here. It's trouble. So when you get into a constructive controversy situation, into a conflict, always be thinking of how we as a group or how we as a, a partners are going to get out. Very important. Creativity. <clears throat> Something that we always have to keep in mind. We always have to be thinking how how are we going to address this from a different angle? What's something new? This is something that I like to just take a look at this. And think of what it says to you. What immediately jumps into your mind? You know, mother too, whose man has just left. And we bring all of our own ideas into that. I mean, I've kind of worked you up to this. You're probably thinking there's something tricky here. <laughs> um, it's not necessarily that simple, right? Whose man? I don't know, what kind of man? It doesn't say father, it doesn't say husband, it doesn't say partner, it just says some man. So, and mother of two, it does not say the age. We sort of often have these assumptions that we're talking about children. Young children, bad man, and all this, but who knows, maybe, maybe she's you know, grown, her kids are grown. It's, it's a totally different situation than we originally believed. Now, to get to the point of all this. <laughs> uh, constructive controversy exercise. Simple, I have four person groups, two people for, two people against the subject. For example, nuclear power in Japan, it could be anything, it doesn't matter, but this is a, a nice flashpoint. So. Uh, I get them to do the research, they do the research, they do a group presentation, two people presenting about it, and then here's the, the important one. I have a test that covers both positions, and all people must write that test. So you're not just writing a test based on your research, you actually have to actively listen to the other presentation. Bonus points. If all the members, all four members, for and against, all score highly on the test, then the group gets bonus points. So there's incentive to not only know your side, but to know the other side. And then we engage in open discussion of shared materials. I get everyone to put all their research on the desk. Everybody can have access to every research point and talk about it. It's not in a debate where you actually kind of hide some, hide some ideas back and I'm going to get them with this one. It's right out there saying, please look at this, use this. And then we reverse positions. Then you flip right over and reverse. And to follow it up, idea synthesis. Okay? We stop advocacy. We stop saying for or against and we say, what is the best possible way to deal with this problem, say nuclear power in Japan or whatever? Um, that's it. Almost on time. <laughs> uh, handbook of Conflict Resolution, fantastic book. It's very thick and big. I didn't bring it because it's much too heavy. There is an e version, but it's also ridiculously expensive. Um, so I have both because it's necessary for me. But I recommend this if you have the money in your budget. Getting to Yes is the, the Yuri and Fisher book, 1990s, great book. Another one, Getting Past No. Uh, it's just there's a whole series. <laughs> and a quick review. And this is me. Thank you very much, Michael Boyce. <laughs> and um, of course, if you have any questions for Michael, at the end of the three talks today, we'll have a, a question and